Hey folks, in this episode, it's a COVID-19 update with my friend Mark Fuccio and the host of This Week in Virology, Vincent Racaniello. This is Twit. All right, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, this has been uh, a long time in the making, this particular episode. As you both know, we've been dialoguing over the, uh, the you know, through email after the first COVID-type production I put together, which was in a web webinar format. We decided to do this one more as a pre-recorded live stream instead of doing the webinar format because, you know, I, there's a ton of things that we need to talk about. And I th just think this format makes more sense to get the information out. So I want to thank both of you guys for coming on the show and covering this with me from the standpoint of having much more knowledge about it than I do. So which is which is important. Uh, Mark Fucci, I want to I want to start just with some some introductions. Obviously, I did the, the brief introduction in the open there, but just a, a more personal introduction. Mark, let's start with you. Who is Mark Fuccio? And, uh, you know, why are you on the show today? Let's talk about that. And then we'll go to you, Vincent. OK, so um, I've and you can uh, talk about I've how we've been a... friends for a decade if you want. You know? <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah. So, yeah, I've. Uh... I was going to lead into that, that, you know, I've been involved in all sorts of, you know, different, uh, you know, tech, leading edge technologies. You know, I've lived in uh, Santa Clara in the Silicon Valley for uh, 29 years. Um, you know, I've known Frederick for about uh, 10 years and helped uh, get him out of Adobe and into a startup storage company named Drobo. And, uh, you know, uh, Along that, uh, that's when I started uh, listening to uh, the This Week in Virology podcast hosted by uh, Vincent. So I've been listening to that show for, man, <laughs> over over 10 years, I think even longer than I've known you, Frederick. So wow. uh, I've had uh, quite an interest in uh, virology. Um, personally, uh, you know, last uh, November in a dark uh, moonlit uh, you know, new moon uh, you know, uh, night, had an accident coming home where I ran into an, an Amazon package and which I wasn't expecting to be there. And shorts, you know, long story short, you know, I tore the, you know, complete tear of the quadriceps tendon on my left leg. So I spent basically three months in the brace recuperating and then, then three months, uh, you know, sheltering in place. So, um, during the, some of the initial recuperation, obviously I had a lot more time to pay attention to things. And, I remember seeing in sort of late November, early December, a uh, little bit of a blurb of news about a new virus coming out of China. So um, fast forward, uh, you know, we saw the whole incident about the Chinese doctor who you know, was fighting it, who got suppressed and who ultimately died. And uh, then, you know, when we turned into January this year, it just exploded as a story uh, in the U.S. and. I don't think anybody can go anywhere in a gathering, you know, uh, either real or virtual with uh, friends or family without uh, COVID becoming a major topic of discussion. So um, I very much enjoyed uh, the, the seminar you did, uh, you know, a couple months ago, Frederick, and I uh, was glad to be able to put you and Vincent together to uh, you know, have a follow up. So you know, that is that is that. Yeah, that's perfect. And that that that. Uh discussion on COVID we did that you mentioned back in the day that we'll link to that in the, the description for this episode. But that was designed to be I think the title of it was uh, something around demystifying COVID-19 for photographers. But it was, you know, turns out photographers are actually humans. So it doesn't doesn't <laughs> it, the fact that it was for <laughs> photographers doesn't really matter. Uh, but I wanted to definitely follow up on that since we've done that. So much stuff since we did that webinar, so much stuff, uh, Vincent, that you're intimate with uh, uh, and the rest of the world, obviously, is to a degree intimate with has happened both on the the understanding of the virus side of things all the way through to disinformation and the politicization of 
you know, the whole mask wearing thing. And you're not American if you if wear a mask. And now you are American if you wear a mask. And, you know, all, <laughs> all this stuff has been happening. So I don't want to make this political, but I do want to touch on the politics of that. Before we before we dive in, Vincent, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the podcast This Week in Virology? Well, I am a uh, professor of virology at Columbia University, which is in New York. I've been working on viruses for over 40 years. I've been doing research on them. I wrote a textbook. I uh, have taught many virology courses. And 12 years ago, I started a podcast. I decided to call it This Week in Virology. I was inspired by Leo Laporte, which uh, who probably inspired you as well, I would guess. Absolutely. And, He's the um, father. We have done this for 12 years, and um, at the beginning of this year, we noticed this outbreak in China. We started covering it, and I think almost every episode from the beginning of 2020 now has been about the virus and the disease, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And, you know, we have always talked about the threats of new viruses emerging, uh, but they weren't taken seriously enough. And we've had big outbreaks. You know, we've had big Ebola outbreaks. We've had Zika outbreaks. We have influenza outbreaks, many other viruses. But I hate to say we were not ready for this. This all could have been avoided quite sadly. So uh, now I am full on in educating people, trying to counter the misinformation. Our listeners have gone way, way up. It's just great. We're getting mentioned by Malcolm Gladwell. We got in USA Today, the New York Times this week. But I think more people need to listen because we really uh, tell it like it is. And so that's the yeah. story. And that's that's fantastic. And thank you for for doing what you do, because uh, like I said, they're, they're, you know, you, you, Vincent, well, both of you guys probably know more than most that the wave of disinformation is just you know, it's just insane. And I'm just from a normal guy standpoint of I under, you know, I understand high school level, at least or college level biology, right? So I understand how things work. I understand evolution and how that works and, and how viruses can adapt. And, you know, I get the science of it. But what I don't get is the human nature side of it and the resistance <laughs> to doing simple things to to you know to safeguard yourself against that biology vincent can you talk about that a little bit you know just yeah exactly mark <laughs> the mask like can you talk about that just the human behavior and the resistance to being safe in the face of danger like stay away from crowds and social distance and try not to breathe other people's air or let them breathe your air because there could be bad things in there you don't know can you talk about just the human nature side of and what you've seen from your perspective well i think in every outbreak or in every aspect of society that involves science there's always some resistance and a great example is the anti-vaccine resistance right globally where we have great scientific evidence that vaccines work, that they're safe, and yet there are still people who don't believe it. And I think increasingly, you know, science has come under fire. Science and scientists, people don't believe it. Not everyone believes it. And so now in the, in this outbreak, which is a global phenomenon, right, everybody on the planet is affected. All the numbers go up, way, way up. You know, not just the number of people infected, but the number of disbelievers and the number of people who spread misinformation. And so, I think people want an answer or answers to what's going on, and they can't get it, so they look for the wrong answers. And, you know, part of the problem with this outbreak is that we have no leadership in this country. And, in fact, the leadership has denied from the start that it was even a problem, uh, and it took a long time to recommend face mask, mask wearing, is still not on board with widespread testing. And I, I think, you know, a lot of the blame goes to the very top. We haven't had top-down leadership. Any other administration, in my opinion, would have handled this far better, and there would be more people buying into what we have to do. Uh, if President Obama said, wear masks, I'm pretty sure everybody would wear masks and mm -hmm. so forth. So it's a, it's a combination of historical distrust of science and on top of it, this particular administration, which is incredibly divisive and fosters its own kind of misinformation on its own. And we're just in a bad confluence of uh, all these things happening at once. 
Yeah. Well, when you have when you have distrust, and Mark, I want to bring you in on this. When when you have distrust of science, you know that's fine. I understand that. Uh, but when you have evidence to prove against that distrust in the form of, you know, mass graves and triage stations set up in the Javits Center in New York, and you know, you can see bodies, you can see people getting sick and dying from this thing. That kind of goes to that it's real, and it's not. It doesn't. It's not subjective at that point, and open to interpretation. And if people that know more than you about a certain thing are saying do A, B, and C, so you don't end up in that pine box and in a mass grave, then you kind of would seems like the logical mind would do that. Mark, why? Why do you? Why do you think that logic is? you know, being put in the back pocket <laughs> and myth and superstition and mistrust is being put forward. I, I think there's uh, two major parts uh, to answer that question. Probably the first is you know, the way people are now getting information. Um, I think people, you know, a large number of people you know, get information by reading a headline. Um, and unfortunately in this world, it's so many of the headlines are designed to be clickbait uh, in order to drive you or pull you into a website <clears throat> yeah. so that they can make uh, money off of uh, giving you a little bit of you know, something hot and juicy and sexy you know, to get your attention. So I think that's part one. I, I, I think the, the second part, there's an old Henry Ford work uh, quote, uh, which is, uh, you know, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is why few people do it. And I think that's uh, apropos because it is a relatively complex uh, subject and the subtleties just don't uh, make it through the headline. And then, unfortunately, it seems more instead of an issue of you know, science and fact or, or facts and logic, it seems it's more of an opinion of, a, you know, a he said, she said, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. You know, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't matter. I'll just do whatever feels good to me. So. Uh, I think you know, we see it at a mass scale, you know, our societal behavior uh, is is disconnected from, uh, you know, some some fairly uh, you know, simple actions that people could take to really uh, limit uh, the spread of this uh, virus. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, you know, it's it's fine to have an opinion, um, but it's when when you when you don't know, it's it's kind of like you know, these zombie movies, right? You go, <laughs> there's zombies, you know that it's a zombie apocalypse. You can see the zombies outside, so board up the windows and don't make a sound <laughs> inside. Maybe they won't come eat your brain, right? And, but this zombie is invisible and tiny, so people are like, I don't care if there's zombies out there, I'm going out there, you know? I don't believe in the zombies. I'm going, <laughs> and that is just, but the problem is they open the front door to the people and the people that believe in the zombies and are trying to be safe inside the house, they let the zombies in and now everybody's dead. Right. So, so Vincent, how do you, you know, what's the situational analysis of where we are today? Right. So versus a month or two months ago when I did that first webinar, where, where are we right now? Are we in the middle of it? Are we, are we at the end of this pandemic or is it, is this thing just with us now? And, and in some form, the world has just changed and COVID is now a permanent citizen of Earth. What, what does it look like? Well, we are not halfway through this pandemic for sure. Um, we have quite a ways to go. This is a virus that'll be with humanity forever, although it won't always be a pandemic. Uh, you know, we went through a period of what we called sheltering, which... The, in the beginning of this outbreak, the purpose of that was to keep the hospitals from getting overburdened. I mean, a, a key point here in this pandemic is that 80% of infections are mild, but 20% require hospitalization, and U.S. hospitals simply don't have the surge capacity to deal with hundreds of thousands of patients. So we kept it down, but then we said, okay, let's try returning slowly back to normal, and states like uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and so forth in the Northeast, we still have low numbers because we haven't opened restaurants and bars. We haven't got any sports. We haven't got any theaters and so forth. Everyone's wearing masks. But other parts of the country went full on and went back mm -hmm. to their regular life without masks. And what happens? Boom, the virus is ripping through them. And so that shows you that you have to keep vigilant 
until such time that we have a vaccine, which isn't going to be till next year. So we have a ways to go, and I'm hoping that people can learn. You have to modify your behavior for the next months, and I'm very worried about the fall when school starts again, because I'm afraid many schools are not taking the proper precautions, and we're going to have even more cases then. This is really, so what really... Are, what- What are the proper precautions for schools? Because a lot of parents, myself included, uh, there are a lot of parents that are, you know, worried about this. You know, what when you send your kid to school, are they going to a get sick or b get infected and bring it home to you? And then here we go. So what what should schools and parents be doing today? The most important thing that any school could do is to institute some kind of broad testing so that every student knows whether or not they're infected. And if we could do that on a daily basis, this would be awesome. And you could, for example, get up in the morning, put a strip of paper in your mouth, get some saliva on it, and in 10 minutes it would tell you if you're infected or not. That's within the realm of doability. Such tests have been developed. And then if you're infected, you stay home. It would be game changing. Why don't we have this? Because We've been working on these very sensitive nucleic acid PCR-based tests, which everyone thought we needed, but they take too long and they're way too expensive. So unfortunately, we now need to retool and make these tests, which we can certainly do, but we're not going to have them ready in time for the fall. That would be the optimal way. However, even if we don't have that yet, schools still need to have some kind of testing protocol at least three times a week because if someone's infected, that's the best way to keep it out of your school. You know, and on top of that, everyone has to wear masks, which I know is really hard. You have to keep physical distance. Uh, Those are the most important things, testing masks, physical distance, modifying your behavior. Otherwise, we're going to have big outbreaks again. And it's going to be here for much longer. Uh, Mark, you you know, looking at it from, from the standpoint of, just, you know, we talked about sort of general situational analysis. And then, you know, the, the next thing sort of to segue into is the dispelling of the myths or disinformation around COVID-19. Right. So I want to I want to talk to you both, Mark, starting with you about about mask effectiveness and the the myth of masks not doing anything. Or is it a myth? Right. So the idea that masks don't do do anything and that it's an infringement on our rights to force you to wear a mask and it's it's going to mess with your respiratory system if you wear a mask all the time. And yada yada. you would Mark, let's start with you. What where do you fall on that? You know, like the what do you say to the person that says, hey, Mark, I'm not wearing a mask because I'm a real American and it's messing with my respiratory system and I'm not sick anyway. So why should I wear a mask? What would you say to that person? Okay, so there's there's a number of dimensions in you know, that objection. The, the first would be, uh, you know, there's really uh, you no know, scientific or medical basis to say that you know, there are uh, medical conditions that uh, you know, get harmed or aggravated by wearing a mask. Uh, you know, for for this, I can give you a reference that you could put in the show notes. Uh, there's a you know, there, there's a YouTube a video by a pulmonologist named Dr. Michael Hansen, who's located in Chicago, and he basically looked at those claims and took them all, all apart, and you know, did a number of uh, demonstrations, basically to, to illustrate that you know, if you're wearing a, a surgical mask like this, or you know, mm-hmm. any. But if they're just wearing a bandana, they have even less interference with the breathing than that type of mask. You know, where he's indicated that it really, it's just, uh, I think the term he uses is horseshit titus. That uh, it's just completely made up. It's a pure preference that they do not want to wear a mask. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I, I think we can just eliminate that. You know, how you convince people not to wear a, or to wear a mask for, if they're not doing it. Now, I, I think you, you need to embrace them and start to think about, you know, you know, do you have this disease? You, do you want to spread the disease? Do you want to you know, take part in you know, spreading this and prolonging this? Because uh, by not having a mask on, you're sharing your breath, your spit, your droplets, you know, your breath, you know, that is potentially covering it and, and, and sharing it. And it's a time for... Uh, you know, sort of a, a common common action that uh, you know, we need we need to uh, collectively you know, try to you know, bring this thing down. I think that uh, part of the 
part of the problem about mask making, you know, certainly part of it is it has been uh, politicized, which uh, is an unfortunate turn of events. But you know, I think uh, ultimately way back when, uh, I, I think uh, I, I think Tony Fauci um, was asked a very uh, a question, and I've been I've been listening to him for years, uh, yeah, and he very gives gives a very precise answer within a very specific uh, context. And unfortunately, his his things don't you know translate well. So you take it out of context, it sounds like a great quote, but it completely destroys the intent and the meaning. And I think he was saying early on, you know, he asked, you know, will mass help and it will help us, you know, stop it. And I believe the answer he gave was that there's no, that there's no proof that it does. You know, it's not mm -hmm. that, you know, mass won't work. Um, but he was asked about, will a mass protect you, <laughs> you know, from getting it? And the answer is probably most masks won't because you'll still, you know, unless it is an N95 mask that, you know, really tightly fits around your nose and mouth. Uh, you're still going to be breathing in the ambient air that could be contaminated with, you know, with the virus. So mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think by answering that question, it got taken all out of context. And you know, some of some of my friends who watch, uh, you know, some of the uh, you know some of the news networks, they say, oh well, you know, masks don't work. Even Fauci said so. You know, therefore, why should we wear them? And I think. Um, it's unfortunate, but again, I think sort of going back to societal behavior, uh, it's difficult to get a simple message communicated and understood by all, let alone having to change the message and then hope that it goes out and gets, uh, uh, you know, ab absorbed. I think you know, I'm in agreement with you know, Vincent's opening comment that this is just a result of, you know, bad leadership at the very, very start, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and... Having said that, back to you. Yeah, Vincent, do you have you have any thoughts on that? So the the I'll pose the same side, kind of a hypothetical situation to you. You know, someone you know someone comes to you and says, "Hey, yeah, like Mark said, I heard uh, Dr. Fauci said that masks don't work early on. I'm going to ride that horse and stay on that." Of course, you know, of course they don't work. It's not airtight, you know, but it's it's preventative. So from your from your standpoint, what would you say to that person that says, I'm not a real American if I wear a mask? Uh, I don't feel like I should. It's messing with my breathing. It gets hot in there, fogs up my glasses. So therefore, I'm not I'm not wearing a mask. What, what do you say to that person that's standing next to you? And they make that statement. Well, I would say that Dr. Fauci was wrong and. He's now changed his stance. He's now saying we should wear masks. They do work. And we know in many other countries, people regularly wear masks when there are outbreaks of respiratory disease and they work. Many countries in the current outbreak have simply mandated mask wearing with very limited shutdown and they have contained the outbreak. Mask wearing really works. And you know, even if you're worried about yourself or you want your own liberties, just think about other people. It's mostly an older person that you might infect and they may die of infection. So just think about that. And, you know, you don't have the right to infect someone else and to kill someone else. So go beyond your own comfort. You know, we're all in this together. And if we all did this, uh, it would really help a lot. I try to appeal yeah. to that, but it doesn't always work, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We, that's a whole different show about people not taking good advice. Right. So then so then here here's another one for both of you guys. Uh, chime in at will. So the hypothetical situation, you're living in a house with people who don't believe in virus. Right. Or there's there's two people in the house that don't that that fall on. the It's it's all a hoax and there's no virus out there. And they're just trying to use this as a tool to oppress us. And then the other side believes of the house, right? They believe that, yeah, this is a real thing and it's life threatening and it's going to kill us if we don't do A, B and C. How do they cohabitate? Like, how do they, or is it possible? Is it, you know, is it, is it a lost cause for the people who do, who do believe or, or is there something they can do other than taping their door shut, <laughs> you know, and stand away from the other people? It's a tough one because the households yeah. are where most of the transmission occurs right among household contacts and so it's a good place to get 
infected. So if you have a mix of people who are masking and not masking, that's really hard. So if I were in that situation, I would wear a mask all the time. I would keep my distance from everyone, you know, my, wash my hands frequently. Trying, If I had a room, I'd stay in it most of the time uh, and stay away from others. I think uh, if you're stuck in the same house, it's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm curious about containment of this thing. I mean, how do is, is, is the analogy, the, the crass analogy I use a lot is kind of like, you know, first of all, the virus doesn't understand states borders. Right. So <laughs> you know, and we're not locking down states. So it's free to move about the country at will. So how do we how do you contain it if one state is, you know, in if you blow up that house kind of analogy with two people living in the same house? two states where one state is for some reason more lax and another state is locked down. Does it matter that the state that's locked down is locked down? It's kind of the crass analogy would be kind of like we're all in a hot tub together and on that side of the hot tub, somebody pees in the water, but you're safe because you're on this side of the hot tub, right? Does it, you know, how do you, how do states or large masses of people that are that are geographically situated next to each other, how do they protect themselves? Is this just the same thing? You just wear a mask and hope for the best? Well, with the travel that we do in this country, no one is is immune from being infected. You know, you can have a state with very few cases, but as soon as people start going there, they're going to bring virus. Today, we talked about New Zealand, which is a, you know, it's an island country of 5 million people. They've pretty much controlled the infection. They don't let anybody in though. And how long are you going to stay like that? Forever? You can't do that in this global economy. Eventually, people yeah. will come in, they will bring the virus. And if any New Zealanders go somewhere else, they're going to get infected. So it doesn't matter if you're in Bozeman or Los Angeles, you're going to get the virus at some point. Because as you said, it doesn't abide by any boundaries because people travel like crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. So, so you know, I, Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, if I if I can check in on this, I, I think yeah. that um, by phrasing the question, uh, I, I think I think it should be rephrased a little bit. Is you know, it's not what can states do? How how can you protect when you have a porous border? You really can't. I, I think uh, unfortunately, this collapses down at an individual level. That you know, effectively, you know, our de facto uh, national policy seems to be and. You know, this is operationally how it's working is, you know, every person for himself, you know, we're not going to do anything to try to control the spread of it. So I think it ultimately boils down on to you are responsible to you protect you know, yourself in terms of minimizing uh, exposure, uh, as well as, you know, just the old bromides, you know, wash your hands, don't touch your face, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are all uh basically uh, tools for uh, minimizing uh, and you know, eliminating the ability to get infected. So yeah. uh, I don't see that, unfortunately, there is a, a national desire you know, at a broader level to, uh, to change that. Yeah. It's all very scary. It's all very scary. Um, it, Vince, I mean, you, when you look at this from, from, just a, a feet on the street standpoint, yeah, obviously there's a risk out there, right? So if someone, worst case scenario, someone gets it, right? They get infected by whatever reasons we've talked about, you know, in the beginning of the show. Is that a death sentence? You know, you know, especially considering the overcrowding of, of hospitals and the lack of ventilators. If you're in a high risk area or with a, where there's a, 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 a high percentage of the population that has been infected and you get it and the hospitals are already overloaded, does that mean, you know, it's time to start working on getting your affairs in order? No, I don't think so. I think uh, in, the, in the last couple of months, doctors have learned to take care of patients. They can't save all of them, but they can prolong the lives of many of them. I mean, of course, hospital capacity is is, is not something you can deal with, although many places are getting creative. You know, they put tent hospitals outside and so forth. So it is not a death sentence. We can figure out uh, how to treat you a little better than we did at the beginning of the epidemic by doing things like uh, instead of you lying on your back in the bed, they put you on your belly and you can breathe a little better. It's called proning. Keeps mm. you off the ventilator a little longer. We've, we've found various treatments like anticoagulants, and uh, anti-inflammatory drugs that can prolong your life. And so 
it's I would not worry, but if you're older, I mean, if you're older, over 65, that's a problem because those are mostly the people who die. And so that's why it's good to avoid getting infected in the first place, because the older you are, the, the more chance you have of getting very, very serious disease. Yeah, yeah. It's all let's just get through this. Let's get it over so we can get on get on with the world. You know, I'm, I'm curious, speaking of getting on with the world where this is COVID-19 and it's named 19 because it was discovered in 2019. We're in 2020, moving into 2021. Rumor has it there'll be numbers after 2021, you know, going forward. Is, <laughs> are we looking are we looking at this virus? You know, this is a virus, right? Which means it's going to mutate. Does it does this mean that this virus will adapt and we'll see a COVID-20 and a COVID-21 or 25 and we'll be back in the same boat again discussing wearing masks and all that? What do, what do you guys think? Well, well, if you just so this is a family of viruses called coronaviruses, right? There are many other viruses, but let's just look at the coronaviruses. In tw in twenty two thousand and two, SARS one emerged, and it went through about eight thousand people before we were able to stop it. Uh, and then in twenty thirteen, MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. That still infects people, although it hasn't become a human virus where where it spreads extensively like this one. And now. Uh, in the third decade, we have a third coronavirus. And by the way, these are all emerging from bat reservoirs in different countries. And there are more viruses where they came from. So the answer is, yes, there will be more SARS-like coronaviruses. I would guess in, in 10 years or so, we're going to have another one emerging, which is going to be different enough so that our vaccines don't work. And it could cause another pandemic. But as I said earlier, we could be ready for this if we just invested in some research, you, we, we could have drugs that would it would impede any coronavirus that came out of bats. We could have those ready if we just did the work. But in the time between SARS-1 and 2, we didn't, even though we knew there were viruses in bats that were threats to us. We didn't do any of this research. Of course, companies, which are motivated by profit, they didn't do anything because there was no infection to deal with. So they, oh, we're not gonna make an antiviral drug or a vaccine because there's no money to be made and governments wouldn't fund the research. So that's why we're in, in the situation we're in now. And I'm really hoping that because of the current pandemic, we can change the way we do this. We can do some more research and have companies motivated uh, to do some research in the interim where there's not as much of a need and to be ready for next time. Because with our technology, there's no reason we, we can't be ready. And I, you know, I'm looking at what the world is doing now, how the world is being essentially brought to its knees by a virus. And it's just not right. It shouldn't be happening. Right. I mean, it seems like, you know, like you said, the, the, these, these pharmaceutical companies are very good at creating all kinds of stuff. You know, uh, it seems if you watch TV, mostly antidepressants, right? So there's just, there's a, they have the yeah. power to create this stuff. And like you said, they, for, for viruses or antiviral medication, they're, they don't seem to be leaning into that because there's less profit in it. But because this is a global pandemic, and like you said, the world is brought to its knees, seems like that's an opportunity now for money to be made, you know, in, in large sums. Is that, is that was, you know, is the bright side of Corona or uh, COVID-19 that the fact that it's opened up a market for this virus. So now that these these pharmaceutical companies will start pumping research dollars into figuring it out so they can make their trillions. What do you, what do you guys think? Well, is, it, is it time for that? Well, the, the reason the companies are going crazy now, they're making drugs and vaccines, is because governments are pumping billions of dollars into them. And no matter what happens, they don't lose. And of course, they see a market. But if this virus went away, and it's not by any means it's not going away but if it did they'd stop making the drugs as well and that's the problem so let's let's look forward to covid 30 right mm -hmm. are we going to be ready no we're not going to be ready because the companies are not going to work on it in the in the meanwhile because there's no profit to be made that is the problem as you said these companies do great when there's money to be made they make all kinds of wonder drugs but for rare diseases or the ones that are on the horizon that we haven't seen yet they're totally useless and we really need need to change the way, the way we approach that. Vincent, I have a question for you. 
Um, you know, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation is doing work. I mean, it's trying to uh, work on cures for malaria and polio, et cetera. Is there any indication that uh, they're doing anything uh, either on uh, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or more generally uh, against this type of uh, attack? And if not them, what about do you have visibility into other other foundations? So the Gates has largely been involved with neglected diseases, right, that affect other than the U.S. You know, malaria is not a problem here and uh, Mm -hmm. tuberculosis and so forth. So they're interested in those. Now, they're certainly putting resources into COVID-19. You have to, no matter, you know, if you're interested in health, you have to be doing that. But, uh, you know, they don't don't support, for example, uh, any research on SARS-like viruses that are in bats. Uh, there are other foundations that do that, of course. And I think the most interesting one, or one of the most interesting one, is the EcoHealth Alliance, which is an environmental nonprofit. Uh, they used to go to China and sample bats for SARS-like coronaviruses. And they're, they're the ones who found that these viruses in bats, there are a threat. And it was their funding that was taken away by the Trump administration earlier this year. And so uh, it's just an example of the work that we should be doing, but which gets interrupted, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, one of, one of the, we have so much to talk about, um, but in the, as, we, as we put the landing gear down and move towards the, the runway, the, the two things I wanna talk about are cons- you know, some viral conspiracy theories as well as the upcoming election, which, is, which may obviously affect things. So looking at the, the, you know, the, the world is in a mad dash and a mad search for a cure, a, a, a vaccine for this coronavirus 19 or, or COVID-19. But I'm seeing conspiracy theories that, hey, if they develop a virus, they're going to un- or uh, develop a vaccine, they're going to unleash this untested, possibly harmful vaccine on you know, impoverished or disenfranchised segments of the population, thereby creating more mistrust, kind of like the mask situation. Vincent, I'm curious what, what you think about that. I'm sure you've seen it. You know, and people are saying, hey, don't take that virus. Don't take that vaccine because they're trying to get you. And Bill Gates is evil, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you say to the people that are that are leaning in that direction? Well, of course, these are all nonsense ideas. Right. And and they have no merit whatsoever. And they're a pro- they're a- product of uh, imaginations run wild. But uh, the vaccines that are being made are being tested. You know, they're they're being pushed really quickly because we need them in an emergency, but they're being tested. And they're not going to do anything to you uh, that these theories are suggesting. Absolutely not. The vaccines are meant to protect you, just like every other vaccine that we have made, to think that Bill Gates or anyone else is going to use them to manipulate you. I've heard one idea that they think when you get injected with the vaccine, they're going to put a microchip into you. Yeah, That's that just ridiculous. You. It's just <laughs> ridiculous. There's no merit to it. The vaccines are there to help you. Millions will believe that, though, right? And I know. what happens problem. when millions believe it and refuse to take the vaccine? And here we go, right? Well, those millions will get infected and get and could die as a result. But, you know, in, uh, reasonable people uh, will take the vaccine and, and hopefully will be protected. And then eventually, you know, these others are going to have to see that there's nothing untoward happening and they better get the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Well, Darwin strikes again, right? So, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, in- so, uh, so both of you guys. So we're we're coming up uh, on November. It's, it's hot and heavy as we record this. We're we're at the end of July, moving into August. The November elections are right around the corner, which means all kinds of insanity and and craziness, especially for this cycle. You know, so this is kind of the worst time to have an election in the middle of a pandemic that's overly politicized and a virus that is, you know, all, all the things that we talked about in this last hour. So what, what's going to happen? You know, Mark, why don't you go first? What, what, what's going to happen as we run up to this election and the politicians, the president and others start using Corona as, or COVID-19 as a platform to say the other side is, is evil or an idiot and do what I say and we get more divisive. What, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I, I think you have the wrong verb tense when you say starting. It, it has started already. 
uh, you yeah. know, we're seeing uh, you know, we're seeing a, a, a claims being made back and forth. Um, I, I, as I said, I think uh, unfortunately our national policy is it's all up to the states, and the states seem to be saying it's up to the counties and individual cities. So you know, there is no consistent policy. Um, and I don't see that uh, changing. I, I think we're going to see the map is going to continue to burn. So instead of having 18, you know, hot list uh, states, it's going to go 18, 20, 25, uh, 30, 35. It may hit, hit all 50. And um, yeah, unfortunately, that uh, our collective societal inability to get together and you know, invest in some of these very simple behavior, very low cost, very easy to do behavior modifications uh, is going to result in, uh, I think, this thing just spreading throughout uh, the entire population. It, it may be possible if some cities or I think Texas may be close to overrunning their health care system. So we may see uh, some states may walk back and uh, close down again. Uh, that may or may not inflict a shock on, uh, on the stock market. Uh, but uh, I think that um, my own analysis is I think things, unfortunately, are pretty grim uh, until we have a vaccine. And then uh, at that point, uh, I see numbers that anywhere from 20 to 50 percent say they don't want to take the vaccine. So, mm -hmm. uh, again, I think it's going to be an individual when the vaccine comes out, you know, go and take it and uh, protect yourself and try to educate and persuade uh, others, you know, that is ultimately in the, their best interests uh, to do so as well. Yeah. Vincent, what, what do you think? Do you see a, do you see a, a similarly grim outlook as we run up to the November elections? So I'm very worried about the elections for the usual reasons, but you know, so far the president has denied the, the seriousness of this infection, but nevertheless, he has pushed forward vaccine development. You know, uh, Project Warp Speed has been funded by the government to push vaccines forward. And and I do not doubt that he will take credit for that if one of those shows some preliminary good results before the election. And it's actually my greatest fear that a week before the election, he'll get on TV and say, look, I made this vaccine. I'm saving you all. And, you know, that'll tip the balance. And I think this right. would be a tragedy for someone who has denied the importance of the virus to suddenly claim uh, victory from it. So this is what keeps me up at night. Uh, so this is going to have a big impact on the election. It's just another way of illustrating how viruses can change history. They've done so in the past. You know, people have brought viruses all over the world as they traveled, uh, cause incredible death in populations that have never seen them before. It's happened over and over. And now it's happening again. And uh, that's why we have to pay attention to them. Yeah. All right, guys, let's wrap this up. Um, I want to give you guys a final word. Mark, uh, I'll let you go first. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share with, with the folks out there that are, you know, uh, confused and worried and, and rightly so? I do. Uh, I would say that uh, yeah, the virus is real. Um, we've barely touched on some of the ways that it attacks uh, the human body. It's not just a pulmonary d you know, disease. Uh, you know, it attacks the nervous system. It attacks the, attacks the heart. Uh, it causes clots. You know, it uh, has a very, very gruesome uh, side effects, uh, even in young people. I mean, there's that story about uh, uh, the uh, Broadway actor, 41, who died. You know, he had uh, he had a number of clots, and he had uh, he had to have legs amputated uh, because of the clots. So. Uh, it's not just a simple case of the sniffles, as our president uh, has said. So uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay away from stay away from uh, infections. You know, stay away from uh, large gatherings of people. Protect yourself, and when the vaccine comes out, go and get it. Yeah, absolutely, Vincent. I'll give you the final word. What do you think? People are worried. People don't want to get it. And they're afraid of other people around them that have it and don't believe it. What, what's, what, what do we do? What's, the, what's your final word? Well, I think uh, 
we need to change the way we live for a good amount of time. We have to f forget about restaurants, forget about theaters, bars, sporting events, stay home. If you have to work, it's fine, but wear a face mask, stay away from people, wash your hands frequently. It's going to be something you're going to have to do for a year because even if we're lucky to have a vaccine at the beginning of 2021, we're not going to be able to get it to everyone for months if we're lucky. I think next summer is the earliest that I see things letting up. So we have a ways to go. We have a year to go, basically. We have a long haul. Nobody's going to escape this. So we all have to do this together. If we could all just think about each other, we're pretty cool. Human beings are a really cool thing when you think about it, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. They're really amazing. And so let's work with each other instead of fighting. You know, the, the thing that gives me the greatest anguish is to see people fighting when humans are fundamentally amazing machines. So if we could all pitch in and help, it would really go a long way. Yeah. Perfect. Great words. Great words. Uh, let's end it there. Mark Fuccio, if, if people want to connect with you and, and see what you're, what you're up to in the world, is there, is there an easy way to reach out to Mark Fuccio? Uh, two ways to do it. Uh, if it's uh, professional engagement of some sort, uh, contact me at LinkedIn. Uh, almost anything else, uh, Twitter, uh, my handle is at Mark Fuccio, M-A-R-K-F-U-C-C-I-O all lowercase, all spelled as one word. And uh, that's those two are probably the best ways to get in touch. Perfect, perfect. And Mr. Vincent Racaniello, if people want to reach out to you and, and check out your show and otherwise engage, what's the best way to do that? Well, I'm all over the place. Uh, you name it, I'm there. You can find me on Twitter, P-R-O-F-V-R-R. -R. I'm on YouTube, the same handle. Uh, you can find my podcast at Microbe. Dot TV. Basically, just search for Earth's Virology Professor and you'll find me. I love it. Yeah, and I'd encourage everyone to reach out and, and subscribe to that podcast, especially now. And congratulations, you know, on the growth of the podcast, regardless of the reasons of that growth. But congratulations on the growth of the podcast and thank you for providing such a great service. This Week in Photo is as my listeners know all about photography, which is a hobby and an art and psychology and all that, but virology, especially right now, and information is life-saving, literally life-saving. So thank you for doing what you do. We, we all appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Yeah, all right. You're welcome. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll end it right there. Thank you both for coming on. And uh, I'm going to put you on the hot seat right now. You got to agree to come on again to, uh, to follow up because I'm sure that we'll have we'll have a ton of questions on this one and there's a bunch of areas that we didn't cover mark like the different side effects of this virus and you know a, a bunch of different things and I'm sure next time we do this there'll be even more information to talk about so yeah thank you yeah I'll have you both on on in a couple of weeks and we'll do this whole thing again all right okay my pleasure wow thank you Frederick good luck to you and your listeners yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Thank you. And you guys be safe and have a, have a great rest of your week. This is Twitter.